Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm going to be talking about parenting styles. I have no financial disclosures or conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. So today we are going to learn about various parenting styles and briefly review literature on this topic. We'll also look at support tools to assess parent-child relationship and learn about strategies and interventions to engage caregivers in healthy disciplining techniques. So parents today are bombarded with a lot of conflicting advice on how to raise their children by a great number of experts, well-meaning friends, family, and professionals. Some say you must use controlled crying. Others say co-sleeping is better. Some say breastfeed on demand. Others recommend schedules. And there are others that say just trust your own instincts. The bright side to all this is the fact that we have so many contradictory views just shows how hard our civilization is working to improve the child's quality of life. History is always an interesting place to start to get a solid perspective on any matter. Um, when I first began to read about the history of child rearing practices, it became clear that for most of history, parents simply did not parent. The term parenting itself is only about 45 years old and came about in the 70s. This gentleman here is Lloyd Demos. He was an American psychohistorian from Michigan who examined over 800 historical references before compiling a book called The History of Childhood, in which he analyzed uh, parenting practices in the Western world. And he made two important conclusions. First, um, that the care of children has evolved in distinct stages, much like patterns of biological evolution. And second, that further back one delves into Western history, the worse these practices were, the lower the level of childcare, and more likely children were to be killed, abandoned, terrorized, and sexually abused. The Evolution of Childhood was an essay based on his book in which he divided the history of childhood into various different modes according to the prevalent parenting practices. So starting with the infanticidal mode, which lasted up to the fourth century AD, where he found hundreds of references to infanticide of both legitimate and illegitimate children in the Western world. It was an accepted and everyday occurrence and neither law nor public opinion found infanticide wrong. Small children and babies were routinely thrown into rivers, flung into trenches, sacrificed to gods or simply left to die by the side of the road or in forests. Then came the abandoning mode, which lasted up to the 13th century where parents would send their children away, often for several years, to wet nurses, to monasteries, to work as servants, or as hostages to pay off their debts. It was a common practice among wealthy as well as poor families. Then in the 14th century came the ambivalent mode, where the emphasis was to severely beat or mold children into convenient shape. So viewed from a modern perspective, most children before the 18th century could be classified as battered children. Instruments such as whips and canes were common. Children were tied to chairs, put in excessively tight swaddles for prolonged periods of time, made to wear iron collars for posture or forced into standing stools to prevent crawling. The thought was to immobilize the child to achieve a controlled child. Then in the 18th century came the intrusive mode which saw the first signs of empathy creeping into the parent-child relationship. Although the prevalence and severity of child beating stopped, strict obedience was demanded in exchange for love and acceptance. The thought was children were meant to be seen and not heard. Then at the end of 19th century came the socializing mode in which the aim was to instill parental values and goals into children rather than producing self-directed and free-thinking individuals. Earlier trends of over-control, terrorizing, or beating were replaced by spanking and psychological manipulation. It was Demos' assessment that this modality continues to guide and inform most parent-child relationships even today. Finally came this new emerging helping mode, which is characterized by empathic response to the child's needs, two-way dialogue with the child, and a greater tolerance for child's emotional self-expression. While the setting of firm boundaries remains important, we are learning to do so without resorting to humiliation, shaming, or violence against the child. Although this parenting style may initially consume more time and energy in children's early years, they appear to develop more independence and self-responsibility later on in their lives. 
As per the American Psychological Association, parenting practices around the world should share three major goals. First, ensuring that children are healthy and safe. Second, preparing children for life as productive adults. And third, transmitting cultural values. A high quality parent-child relationship is critical for healthy development. Nature versus nurture is one of the oldest debates in the history of psychology. Nature is what we think of as pre-wiring and is influenced by genetic and hereditary factors. Nurture is generally taken as the influence of external factors after conception, like environmental factors and life experiences of an individual. A recent study pretty much settled the nature versus nurture debate. 50 years of research on 14.5 million pairs of twins revealed that genetics and environment have roughly equal influence on human traits. For example, a child may come from a family where everyone is tall, and he may have inherited these genes for height. However, if he grows up in a deprived environment where he does not receive proper nutrition, he would never attain the height he might have had had he grown up in a healthier environment. Today, most experts recognize that both factors play a critical role, and not only that, but they also realize that nature and nurture interact in important ways throughout life. Parenting style determines largely the kind of environment a child is raised in. Thus, good parenting impacts a child in a significant and undeniable way. This lady is uh, Diana Baumrind, who was a clinical and developmental psychologist and researcher from New York, who is known for her work on categorizing parenting styles in the 1960s. Her research is known as Baumrind's Parenting Typology. She noticed that preschoolers exhibited distinctly different types of behavior, and each type of behavior was highly correlated to a specific kind of parenting. So based on extensive observation, interviews, and analysis, Baumrind initially identified three parenting styles, authoritative parenting, authoritarian parenting, and permissive parenting. Although she coined parenting styles later in the 1980s, Maccabee and Martin were the ones who refined her model and expanded permissive parenting style into two different types, permissive and neglectful parenting, leaving us with a total of four parenting styles and a lot of today's talk is going to surround these four types. Parenting styles are categorized into these four styles based on two dimensions of parenting behavior. We have the demandingness or expectation, which refers to the extent to which parents demand their child's maturity. And second is responsiveness or warmth, which refers to the degree to which parents are accepting and sensitive to their children's emotional and developmental needs. Parenting is bi-directional. Not only do parents influence their children, but children influence their parents as well. Parental personality traits are among the most important factors influencing parenting styles. The personality traits of extroversion, agreeableness, and openness to experience is associated with greater intimacy and child-centered parenting. Parenting style may also differ by differences in age where lower maternal age has shown to predict harsher and less supportive parenting with toddlers. It has also been observed that mothers with history of maltreatment in childhood may suffer from greater parenting stress. Generally speaking, most parents will parent the way their parents treated them. So individuals that had a loving and responsive childhood have more intimacy and acceptance towards their children and ultimately adopt a positive parenting style. Whereas parents with harsh parenting during their own childhood may treat their children strictly and believe in using more physical punishment for their children as their parents believed. Child characteristics play a huge role as well. An infant with an easy temperament may enable parents to feel more effective as compared to a fussy infant. Over time, parents of more difficult children may become more punitive and less patient with their children. Parenting style varies on child's gender as well. Physical punishment and providing more scientific explanation is mostly used for boys, while girls, on the other hand, are given more reasoning and more emotional talk. Children with disabilities and chronic diseases may have more behavioral problems as compared to children without disabilities, and hence their parents may overprotect, leading to improper parenting. 
Finally, the world around us, such as the neighborhood, school, social networks, can also affect parenting, even though these settings do not always include both the child and the parent. Mothers who perceived their neighborhood as more dangerous showed less warmth with their children, perhaps because of the greater stress of uh, living in a threatening environment. Parents who experience economic hardships tend to be more easily frustrated, and this can affect their parenting skills. It would be interesting to see if parenting styles have changed from pre-COVID times since having lived in a stressful environment for two years now. All this is just to say that a lot of factors play a role into parenting. These are the four types based on Baumrin's research. Chances are parents will fit into one category or even more of these four categories, depending on the circumstances. Before we jump into the characteristics of individual styles, this is a visual to help compare different styles. So the top right corner is authoritarian style, where parents act more like drill sergeants and expect strict obedience. Next to it is the authoritative style, where parents behave as warm leaders and create a positive environment. Bottom right is the permissive style, where the thought process is kids will be kids, so we let them do whatever they like. And next to it is the uninvolved style, where parents are typically uninterested in their children's life. So starting with the authoritarian style, which is highly demanding and not supportive, authoritarian parents are normally less nurturing and have high expectations with limited flexibility. Parents of this style tend to have a one-way mode of communication where the parent establishes strict rules that the child obeys. There is little to no room for negotiations from the child, and the rules are usually not explained. They expect their children to uphold these standards while making no errors, and if there are errors, it usually leads to punishment. Research shows that children that grow up with authoritarian parents will usually be the most well-behaved in the room because of the consequences of misbehaving. They are obedient and proficient, but score lower in happiness and self-esteem. They lack social competence and have inability to make decisions as the parent generally predicts what the child should do instead of allowing the child to choose by themselves. The children also rarely take initiatives and lack intellectual curiosity. They're socially withdrawn and look to others to decide what's right. Strict parental rules and punishments often influence the child to rebel against authority figures as they grow older, leading to more behavioral problems and mental issues, along with poor academic performance. Next is the authoritative type, which is highly demanding and highly supportive. Parents normally develop a close, nurturing, and supportive relationship with their children. They have clear guidelines for their expectations and explain their reasons associated with disciplinary actions. Disciplinary methods are used as a way to support instead of punishment. Not only can children have input into goals and expectations, but there's also frequent and appropriate levels of communication between the parent and their child. Overwhelming research over the last 25 years shows that authoritative parenting style leads to the healthiest outcomes for children, but requires a lot of patience and effort on both parties. Children are happy, successful, and content. They develop greater competence, self-confidence, and ability to self-regulate emotions. They exhibit fewer behavioral problems and have higher academic achievements. Since these parents also encourage independence, their children will learn that they are capable of accomplishing goals on their own. They can manage their negative emotions more effectively, which leads to better social outcomes, better emotional and mental health, like less depression, delinquencies, and drug use. Next is the permissive style, which is highly supportive and not demanding. So parents are warm and nurturing, but lax. They fail to set firm limits to monitor children's activities. These low levels of expectation usually results in rare use of discipline. They allow children to make many of their own decisions at an age where they are not yet capable of doing so. They can eat meals, go to bed when they feel like it, and watch as much television as they want. They do not have to learn good manners or do any household chores. Communication remains open, but parents allow their children to figure things out for themselves. Uh, this is described as an indulgent style where parents act more like friends than parents. 
these kids tend to rank low in happiness and self-regulation. They can be impulsive, demanding, selfish, leading to more problems in relationships and social interactions. Children with permissive parents tend to have high self-esteem, good social skills, but are more likely to experience problems with authority as they cannot follow rules and tend to perform poorly in school. Accepting responsibility is difficult for many of them. Limited rules and freedom to this degree can lead to other negative habits as the parent does not provide much guidance on moderation. Next is the uninvolved style where parents are unresponsive, unavailable and rejecting. An uninvolved parent does not utilize a particular disciplining style and has limited amount of communication with the child. They tend to offer a low amount of nurturing while having either few or no expectations of their children. Children are given a lot of freedom as parents normally stay out of the way. They fulfill the child's basic needs while generally remaining detached from their child's life. These kids tend to rank lowest among all life domains, especially emotional self-regulation, self-esteem, and competency as compared to peers. They may have academic challenges and difficulty with maintaining or nurturing social relationships due to less effective coping strategies. They are more prone to mental issues, delinquencies, and addiction problems. The children of uninvolved parents are usually resilient and may even be more self-sufficient than children with other types of upbringing, a skill that is developed out of necessity. A number of new forms of parenting have surfaced in recent years, most of which do not fit neatly under any of these four Bombrins categories. I'm going to talk about some of the most popular parenting styles in the United States today. So this is overparenting, which is an umbrella term for out of the norm yet effortful parenting. It includes helicopter parenting, intrusive parenting, lawnmower parenting, and some other forms as well. All these types are along the same spectrum with some minor differences. Recent years have shown that overparenting appears to be more prevalent among parents of late adolescents and young adults. So a helicopter parent is a parent who excessively shields and problem solves for the child rather than allowing the child to experience a failure or challenge. In this way, the helicopter parent prevents the child's personal growth. An intrusive parent is the one who overschedules and micromanages their children, discouraging free time and independent behavior. Intrusive parents often function poorly without their child. And the lawnmower parent is a parent who quite literally mows problems out of their child's path. They seek to remove all perceived obstacles from their child's growth and are frequently cited as interfering with academics and athletics to an excess. So put simply, overparenting suggests behaviors beyond what most parents would do. All available research on this parenting practice points to more negative than positive outcomes for the child. In young children, overparenting has been linked to anxious, depressive, dependency, and insecure tendencies. Helicopter parenting is correlated with lower levels of a variety of indicators of psychological well being. In theory, the extreme levels of parental responsiveness could teach kids that they're exceptionally important and worthy of intensive care and attention from others. It is therefore hypothesized that overparenting will be associated with greater narcissism in young adults. They tend to have underdeveloped coping and problem solving skills as others intervene to solve problems on the child's behalf. Next is free range parenting, where children are allowed to be more independent than traditional parenting would allow. It is the polar opposite of helicopter parenting. Free range parents allow children to make choices and learn from the consequences of their choices. Hence, they develop a great sense of responsibility for their own lives. This parenting style emphasizes self-direction and respect for the child's needs. I recently came across a Netflix show called Old Enough, which is set in Japan and it's based on free range parenting. It was very different and interesting to watch kids as little as three year olds going to the supermarket alone or riding the subway by themselves. Um, Although free range parents are sometimes accused of neglect in the US, free range parents can indeed be warm and responsive to their children, but simply believe that children should be given more freedom and autonomy. There is limited research on this particular style, but a few observations were made, like children were more creative in their expression as there is light supervision. They develop effective problem solving skills. 
There's also a higher chance of accidents as child spends more time unsupervised and it may take a while for the child to really understand what is safe and what is not. Next, we'll briefly look at the literature on how parenting styles ties up with each aspect of a child's life at different ages, such as development, education, oral health, dietary habits, etc. So this first study that we are going to look at was done in 2018 to determine if parenting style during early childhood impacts the sensory adaptation and behavioral outcomes of infants in the first two years, and also to determine if this effect would be greater in preterm than term infants, as we know that preterm infants are at a higher risk than their term counterparts for subsequent developmental and behavioral problems. A prospective cohort study was conducted and 103 infants, 51 term, 51 preterm and 52 term were analyzed. Three different screeners were used to assess these uh, different parameters. Results showed that infant adaptation to the sensory environment is associated with parenting style in the first year. It also showed that highly permissive parenting, more than any other parenting style, is associated with increased behavioral difficulties in children at two years. The next study was based in Kenya, and the goal was to assess the impact of parenting styles on academic achievements. The study was conducted in 20 public primary schools in one particular county in Kenya using a descriptive survey. The instruments that they used for the study included questionnaires, observation checklists, and structured interviews. Results showed that children of authoritative parents were very social and interactive with the teachers to achieve goals set by their parents. Authoritarian parenting results in children being socially withdrawn and can lead to lower academic performance. Permissive parenting led to children who are mostly impulsive, disorganized, and they were less successful on academic tasks. So from these findings, it was evident that uninvolved parenting and permissive parenting styles impacted negatively on the academic achievement of the learners. This was a study done in Boston Medical Center in 2006 with the goal to determine the relationship between parenting styles and overweight status in first grade. They gathered data from a total of 872 children. Multivariate logistic regression analysis was used to evaluate the relationship between parenting styles and uh, overweight status, setting controls for a lot of things like gender, race, maternal education, income to needs ratio, marital status, and child behavior problems. Results showed that among the four parenting styles, children of authoritarian parents were associated with the highest risk of being overweight among young children, followed by children of permissive and neglectful parents. Children of authoritative parents had the least risk of being overweight. This next study was a study done in Singapore in 2020 to examine the relationship between parenting styles and parental attitudes towards oral health practices in children. They gathered data from parents of 389 children aged four to six years presenting to four public dental clinics. Various screeners were used to assess parental attitudes and child's oral health. Results showed that authoritative parents were more likely to monitor sweets intake, less inclined to offer sweets in exchange for good behavior, and more likely to ensure bedtime toothbrushing. From the findings, it can be concluded that authoritative parenting was associated with positive attitudes regarding both preventive dietary and oral hygiene practices. This study was done in the United Kingdom in 2011 to examine whether parenting styles was associated with children's TV viewing. They gathered data from a total of 431 parent-child duos. The instruments for the studies included questionnaires about individual child and parent TV viewing, parenting style, and child-reported parental sedentary restriction scores. Multinomial logistic regression was used to examine whether child TV viewing was predicted by parenting style or family restriction. Results showed that a great proportion of children with permissive mothers watched more than four hours of TV per day, risk being 5.2 times higher compared with children with authoritarian or authoritative mothers. This last study that we look at was a US-based study done in 2009 to explore association between parenting style and different driving behaviors like seatbelt use, speeding, road rage, using substances or cell phone devices while driving, etc. 
They gathered data on driving safety behaviors from a huge sample of 5,665 kids. Results showed that compared with teens with uninvolved parents, those with authoritative parents reported 50% less crash risks in the past year, 71% uh, less likely to drive when intoxicated, less likely to use a cell phone while driving, and likely to use seat belts nearly twice as often and speeding one half as often. These parenting styles uh, and studies do have their own limitations and criticisms. When interpreting research results, it is important to note that most of these parenting studies only find links between parenting styles and outcomes. That is, the results are only correlation and not causation. Most parenting research also does not tell us which one is the correct cause and effect relationship? So why do most psychologists and experts still recommend authoritative parenting styles? First, there is overwhelming volume of studies consistently showing positive outcomes for children raised by authoritative parents. And second, there's really no research that shows authoritative parenting style causes harm to children. So what does the AAP say? So after a long gap of 20 years in December 2018, AAP updated its policy statement on guideline for effective discipline. These are some of the highlights of the statement and provides guidelines for pediatricians and other child health care providers. It recommends educating parents on not using corporal punishment and offering guidance about child behavior and parenting practices focusing on explaining effective discipline strategies and sharing current evidence about long-term harm with spanking. It also encourages pediatricians to advocate for children and offer support and resources to families when needed. So now that we've reviewed how parenting style plays a huge role in child development, it raises a lot of questions like, what do we do with this information? How do we use it in our practice? Should we screen? And if yes, do we have a tool to screen? Uh, more number of screeners at any visit means more time invested by the families to accurately finish them. So is it going to be a point of frustration for the caregivers to fill out another extra screener or can we effectively help the families with the information we receive from the um, screeners? I came across a few available screening tools like the PSI, which is the Parenting Stress Index, the Pediatric ACEs, which we are more familiar with, um, and PSDQ, which is the Parenting Styles and Dimension Questionnaire. But I thought the Quick Parenting Assessment, the QPA, was a perfect fit as it specifically focused on parenting assessment. And here are a few features of the QPA. So the QPA was developed at Vanderbilt University. It is a parent support tool that integrates healthy discipline education into the pediatric primary care visit. It is brief, non-stigmatizing, and helps healthcare providers determine the right level of support needed for that individual family. We know that exposure to unhealthy discipline is associated with many mental and physical health problems. Hence, it is important to support parents' use of healthy discipline strategies in order to improve children's socio-emotional health and prevent diseases. The QPA is designed for parents of young children of ages 1 to 10 years in settings such as well-child visits and behavioral assessments. Studies show that parents begin using unhealthy discipline early in a child's life, so screening every couple of years is recommended, starting when children are young. At the Vanderbilt Clinic itself, they administer the QPA to parents at the 15-month, the 30-month, the 5-year, and the 8-year well visit. The QPA can be used as a standalone screening tool or combined with the pediatric ACEs, which is a more comprehensive screening instrument that screens for other childhood and parent stressors as well. It takes about one minute to complete the QPA and about one to two minutes to respond to elevated scores using an evidence-based method. The QPA has been tested and validated using validation studies done at Vanderbilt, which showed that children with elevated QPAs were nine times more likely to have behavioral problems and to have been referred for mental health services compared with children with low QPAs. The QPA assesses for a child's recent exposure to five unhealthy discipline strategies that are associated with adverse outcomes. Healthcare providers respond with an appropriate intervention using an algorithm with suggested scripts, resources, and discharge instructions. So this is how the screener looks like. 
parents answer 12 yes or no questions that assess how their child has been disciplined in the previous month, the top box has seven questions which asks about discipline practices of the presenting parent, and the bottom box has five questions which ask about discipline practices of other caregivers, giving pediatricians valuable insight on the discipline practice of the caregivers who do not attend the clinic visit. We are looking for a child's recent exposure to five unhealthy discipline strategies, um, and they're highlighted in yellow, which includes overuse of punitive discipline, speaking angrily, yelling, threatening, physical punishment, or using humiliating language. The QPA also has two positive discipline questions, uh, which are highlighted in green, that's question one and seven, which focuses on redirecting and spending more time with the child to explain expectations. When discussing results with parents, one should consider starting the conversation with what parents are doing well and then move on to the things that they need help with. Once the form is filled out and scored, they fall into three risk zones. Uh, we have the low risk, which is a score of zero to two, medium risk, which is a score of three to four, and a high risk, which is a score above four. Any score above three requires an intervention. Now, typically in our ETSU clinic, we have our wonderful behavioral team that helps us out with appropriate interventions for behavioral problems. But if it is an outpatient practice, like the one I'll be going into where there isn't a behavioral team in clinic, then one can rely on the suggested scripts and algorithm. So in response to high scores, the algorithm suggests introducing this one minute evidence-based intervention called Play Nicely, the Healthy Discipline Program which has been in use for over 15 years at Vanderbilt. It starts off with a question which goes like, assume you see one young child hit another, what are you going to do? The reason they picked this question was first, the question assesses childhood aggression, which is one of the strongest risk factors for violence later in life. And second, it opens the door for discussions about healthy discipline strategies. Next, it presents 20 options to respond to an aggressive child, which we see on the left. Some options are good, some are bad, and some are okay. Families will view options that are of the most interest to them. And then at the end of the office visit, families go home with discharge instructions and a handbook as seen in the image, which discusses each of these 20 options in detail. A free online version is available as well. Um, the program content is based on materials from many sources, including the AAP, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, and the American Psychological Association. Vanderbilt has also conducted multiple studies to confirm the effectiveness of this Play Nicely program. I personally thought it was an extremely neat tool to use in clinic settings, as we see a lot of frustrated parents come to clinic due to their child's behavior problems. And most parents all over the country report that they receive no information about parenting, partly because it may be challenging to determine the right level of support needed for an individual parent or family without a screening tool. And hence, having a screener allows pediatricians to initiate such conversations. This is another wonderful tool to bring into an exam room called Parenting Pyramid to engage caregivers in healthy disciplining techniques. The goal of this pyramid is to create a positive experience for each child but also focus on teaching children appropriate social skills needed to develop friendships. The idea is more solid the base of the pyramid or stronger the foundation is, it is unlikely parents will need to resort to interventions at the top of the pyramid. So the two tiers at the base of the pyramid focuses on positive interactions like engage playtime, talking, listening, celebrating, and hence should be used liberally by the caregivers. These base skills lay the foundation of the parent-child relationship and make all aspects of parenting, even discipline and consequences, easier and more effective. When parents overuse higher tier interventions and forget about the base, children can become discouraged and will stop trying to behave properly because they feel they're unable to get any attention from their parents other than negative attention. When all else fails, we generally refer for PCIT which stands for Parent-Child Interaction Therapy. It is an evidence-based behavior parent training, treatment for young children with emotional and behavioral disorders that places emphasis on first, improving the quality of the parent-child relationship, and second, changing the parent-child interaction patterns. 
This image here shows how PCIT is conducted. As you can see, children and their caregivers are seen together in PCIT. It is conducted through coaching sessions during which parent and child are in a playroom while the therapist is in an observation room watching the parent and child interaction through a one-way mirror or a live video feed. Also, parents wear a bug in the ear device through which the therapist provides in the moment coaching on skills the caregiver is learning to manage the child's behavior. PCIT is done across two treatment phases. The first phase of treatment focuses on establishing warmth in the parent-child relationship through learning skills that help children feel calm, secure in the relationship with their parents and good about themselves. And the second phase of treatment focuses on coaching caregivers in the application of specific therapy skills to help the child accept limits, comply with directions, respect house rules, and demonstrate appropriate behavior in public. The basis of this treatment strategy is that a warm and secure parent-child attachment enhances the child's desire to please the parent and willingness to comply to parents' demands. There are a lot of resources available to share with parents at office visits. I really like these two resources. Um, and these images are straight from their websites. Uh, what I like about the CDC website is that it divides positive parenting tips based on different ages, making it easier to navigate. And Behavior Checker is based on giving solutions for about 100 or more behavioral problems, like being too fidgety in the car or making a mess while eating or not listening to instructions. So in my mind, CDC resource seems more of a prophylactic intervention and behavior checker seems more of a therapeutic intervention. So in conclusion, I think all children are different and basically there are as many parenting styles as there are parents. So I do not believe one size fits all, but being warm and setting high standards is the best parenting style. Also, Disciplining is a huge component of parenting, and hence it is crucial to discuss parenting and healthy disciplining techniques in office visits. And that's all I have. These are my references. Any questions, comments? <laughs> Hi, this is Dr. Alfaro. Um, I just want to congratulate you because it's really a good topic that we don't get to hear a lot. And I actually learned a little bit about it, uh, well, actually a lot about it, but mostly kind of, you know, remind me what type of parents our parents were and, you know, how much has an influence on that. But I just wanted to congratulate you because I feel it's a really interesting topic that we usually don't get to hear about. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Like we never really discuss it in clinic enough. And I thought it was really important since parents play such a big role in the kid's life. Ishta, uh, I thought that was an awesome presentation. Uh, I did have a question uh, and part of this comes from kind of some internal debates uh, I've been having myself as a parent uh, being married to a Psychologists, uh, we have some conversations about parenting pedagogy, and uh, I was just wondering uh, if you came across any research on parents who changed their parenting style, and uh, you know, kind of mid mid course, uh, either through PCIT or one of these other interventions, uh, how that changes outcomes. So I actually did not come across uh, anything. Um, where it showed that parents change their parenting styles. But a lot of studies did show that even for parents, they may actually swing from one parenting style to a different parenting style, depending on the circumstances that they are in. And I did find a lot of research on like when, child, when the child grows up, what do they think about the parenting style? But there was not a lot of conclusive data on that. So I didn't include it in my presentation, but I thought it would be nice to know like you follow children when they're like adolescents and then kind of try to see what they thought about what their parents did was correct or not. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Uh, Cause you know, there's a real push towards uh, there's something called respectful parenting. 
Uh, there, there are several kind of parenting philosophies that I've seen other parents use uh, for for toddlers where they try and remove any situations where you have to uh, basically say no to the child because they view that as harmful, uh, which sounds an awful lot like uh, permissive parenting. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, the advice that we give parents too, you know, giving toddlers a choice uh, rather than setting a rule for them or uh, or kind of finding ways to skirt making a firm boundary, uh, you know, in, in some ways sounds more permissive than authoritative. Uh, it's developmentally appropriate, but I was just think it's interesting how things change over time. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. And a special thanks to Dr. Tolliver for helping out with this talk.